So I'd like to introduce uh, a representative from uh, uh, Teach for America, which is um, an organization that uh, has done and is doing a lot of good, uh, promoting goodness in the world. And uh, I'd like to, uh, as in 1504, we've been supporting them for the last few years, and we'd like to continue to do that. So please. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, I will take not 90 seconds. My name is Josh Bieber. I, uh, wow, hey now. All right, I feel positive. Um, I, was, um, I was a Teach for America Corps member and I now uh, work for TFA. I do new site development. Um, so when I was a senior, I had like marginally considered this as an option. Uh, and had it not been for a very pushy phone call uh, from the very pushy uh, TFA recruiter, on the deadline day, I would not have applied. Uh, but I hesitantly took like two hours, filled out the essays, and now owe her for, or owe that phone call for the best two years of my life and truly the happiest. So if I have 60 seconds, there are just two things I would want people to know about TFA. I, I think you know what we are. Um, one is that this country does not serve all kids in our schools uh, fairly. So low-income kids, before they even leave elementary school, are years behind where they should be, and nearly not even half of them graduate high school, which is like a terrible injustice, um, a complete injustice. Uh, two, like you can actually make a difference. So I was as skeptical as they come about TFA and my ability and all the rest, um, but like I know this to be true. Um, if you walk into a class of fifth graders who on day one are years behind where they should be and hate school and are kind of inclined to hate you because of it, and nine months later they leave on or above grade level like begging for summer work and wanting you to like hang out on the weekend, you kind of think anything is possible. Um, and that's, you know, clearly I'm here now. Uh, so for me, Teach for America was an opportunity to actually align my actions with my thoughts and my hopes and be part of the change we all, you know, we all talk about wanting to see. Um, so I would encourage you all, regardless of what you think uh, you may do next year or where you may go beyond that, to like really consider this. It was the best thing I could have done. Um, the final deadline is tomorrow. It's easy to do. You don't need recs. Like, just apply. Um, and give yourself the chance to fall in love with it the way that I did. Um, and I would just end by saying, you know, if you're in this room right now, like, you probably have had the best education anyone your age anywhere could possibly have. Um, and like, our students and our schools need you. So uh, please join us. Thank you very much for the time, and uh, have a good class. Hi, everyone. Quickly, um, if there are any extension students or undergraduate students who were not able to make section this week, we have an open section tonight at 7.30. Um, that'll be videotaped for the extension school. So if you are available and interested in attending that, please come see me after class. Thanks. Now, I'd like to introduce now um, to um, very dear friends and um, supporters of positive psychology who are doing arguably more than anyone else to, to disseminate the ideas of positive psychology in a rigorous and fun way. Um, and I'm go I, I've asked them to give a, a brief presentation about the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology at UPenn, the only master's degree, well, the first master's degree in the world. There are a couple of others now. And um, they'll talk a little bit about, just for 15 minutes, about the masters before we jump into, um, uh, into, into our material today, which hopefully will be exciting. So James and Debbie, please. Thank you very much, Tal. It's great to be here with you guys. Um, and what a delight to be able to spend a few minutes with you in such a very special class where you're combining the science of positive psychology uh, with its practice. And of course, as you very quickly figured out, Tal is such a master teacher, somebody who's able to take complex ideas and make them simple without making them simplistic and also making um, inspiring and uh, making the presentation motivating so that we want to go out and apply the ideas that, that we're studying. 
I'm curious, how many of you here um, are interested in applying the science of positive psychology in your own personal lives? It's part of why you're here. Can I see your hands? Okay, great. How many of you are here because you're also potentially interested in applying the science of positive psychology in your future career decisions, like in your job and eventually? Okay, great, excellent. I hope, I hope you do just that. And um, for those of you who are interested in taking positive psychology, the study of positive psychology, deeper in a graduate level program for your own um, knowledge, but then also to be able to take what you're learning into your profession, uh, we're delighted to be able to tell you a little bit about the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program at the University of Pennsylvania and to, to talk a little bit about uh, taking positive psychology from the classroom to the world. Now, as you know, positive psychology is just about 10 years old. It was started in 1998 when Marty Seligman was the president of the American Psychological Association and positive psychology was one of his presidential initiatives. About four years ago, Marty Seligman started the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And the mission of the Positive Psychology Center is to promote research, training, education, and the dissemination of positive psychology. So in January of 2005, I joined the Positive Psychology Center as the Director of Education and Senior Scholar. The next month in February of 2005, Debbie Swick came on board as the Associate Director of Education. Our task was to create a master's program and to have it up and running by the fall. So again, I got there in January, Debbie came in February, we got our brochure out and printed and published in March, our application deadline was in April. Kind of, a compre kind of optimistic, I suppose, um, and we didn't know if anybody would show up, we didn't know if anybody would be interested. Uh, but um, we needn't have worried. We got over 100 applications and we accepted 36 students into our program for that fall. And things have just really been going uh, well and, and, and uh, hopping ever since. This is our current class uh, on their first day of class uh, in the fall of 2007. We have 41 students in our class um, this year. So I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about the, the students. Actually, three of our graduates uh, or current students are teaching fellows in this class, so that's exciting. Um, Debbie Cohen and Elizabeth Johnston, where are you? If you guys would stand up. And Elizabeth Peterson. Great. So we have, and if you, if you look on the upper left corner, Gabriel de Corral was a student here in this class two years ago when we came and presented on the program, and he is currently a student in the, in the MAP program. So there's a lot of um, synergy uh, going back and forth between this class and our, our master's program. Our students range in age from 22 to 62. They come from all across the United States, from Vermont to Florida to California. They come from around the world. We've had students from the UK, from Norway, Switzerland, India, Malaysia, Japan, Hong Kong, um, South Korea, and New Zealand. About 25 to 30 percent of our students are younger students who are just out of college and are looking to immerse themselves in positive psychology before going on into their professional training. The rest of our students are professionals who come from a wide variety of professions. Uh, in our first class, we had the former chief social worker, uh, chief social work inspector for the entire country of Scotland was in the class. That was very interesting. We've had a kidney transplant surgeon, a former vice president of J.P. Morgan. We've had attorneys, uh, directors of development for nonprofits, uh, the executive director of a school, Carl Brook Academy, is in our class this year, human resources directors, consultants, executive coaches even a professional musician and a professional comedian. So it's uh, quite a, a, a cross cut of, of students in the class. Just in a couple of minutes, I wanna give you a little bit more of a sense of what the educational design is and just a brief overview of the, of the coursework. So this um, MAP program is uh, a one year, one calendar year of full-time study. Students begin in, this, in September and they end in August. They're, the educational design is a hybrid model. So once a month, students are on class for on site at, at Penn for intensive on-site classes. And then in the intervening periods, there are distance learning modules that the students complete. 
This is a professional master's degree, and it focuses on the theory and application of positive psychology in various professional domains. So at this point, there's not a separate licensing or credentialing in positive psychology itself. Students come from education, business, law, medicine, etc., bringing their own, own credentials with them. So this design of um, having students on campus once a month for intensive classes allows students to continue working full time. Now I just said that the program was full time and you may be wondering, well, how can students work full time and study full time? Keep in mind this is a professional degree um, and an executive education model that's intended uh, to be, it's designed for people who are themselves working full time and still taking classes full time. So most of our students continue in the work they've been doing, continue to work full time while they, while they come to our class. Another advantage of this model is that students aren't required to live in or near Philadelphia. Students can commute, can commute in from across the United States, and um, what has been a surprise and a pleasure to us, students have decided to commute in from as far away as Europe and Asia. So I don't know what your commute today was like to come to class, but some of our students come from as far away as South Korea and New Zealand every month to be a part of the positive psychology classes. So you can imagine that that adds a real excitement and energy to the class um, and puts a little bit of pressure on the professors to make sure that we have something worth coming halfway around the world for. Um, this enhances the educational experience obviously by increasing student diversity. We have students who are um, living abroad and coming in for the classes and also we're allowed to tap, we're able to tap into the expertise of professors not just at the University of Pennsylvania but also at, at other schools as well so that we can bring in the very top leading researchers and practitioners of positive psychology. A brief overview of the schedule of on-site classes in the fall of 2008 you can see there that there are five different intensive on-site weekends in the spring as well with distance learning in the intervening times. So just very briefly, the courses, each student takes four courses in the fall, four courses in the spring, and ends with a capstone course. In the fall, the courses focus on the foundational theory of positive psychology. Marty Seligman teaches the Introduction to Positive Psychology course. Um, Angela Duckworth teaches a course on research methods and evaluation. It's very important for our students to have a, a real good grasp of the, the, the science of positive psychology, understanding uh, the research methods behind the, the results. I teach a course on the foundations of positive interventions, and then our fourth course is Approaches to the Good Life, where we have different leading researchers come in and talk about their research. In the spring, our courses focus not so much on the theory but now move to the application of positive psychology since it is a master of applied positive psychology. I don't know if you've studied yet the uh, character strengths and virtues, um, the values in action classification spearheaded by Chris Peterson. If you haven't done that yet, you, I'm sure you shortly will. He himself comes in and teaches a course on the work that he has, uh, that he has done. I teach a course on applied positive interventions and we have a service learning component uh, as a part of, of that class. Karen Rivich and Judy zaltzberg levick teach a course on positive psychology and individuals. So this is how to use positive psychology relationally um, with, with other people, whether it's in a work environment or with friends or, or family. And then finally, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with appreciative inquiry. Again, I expect if you're not, Tal will be introducing it to you during the course of the semester. David Cooperwriter is the leader of this uh, of this field of inquiry which basically takes positive psychology approaches into organizations and seeks to foster change at the level not just of individuals but at the level of the whole. The final course that students take then is the capstone project which happens over the summer uh, and this is an independent project where students are able to um, integrate what they've learned in their classes and take it a step forward in the direction in which they want to go in their own professional application of this. So we've had students do uh, research, quantitative research or qualitative research. Uh, we've had students uh, do literature reviews in a particular area of interest, book proposals for books they want to write, um, or workshop proposals and, uh, and those kinds of things. So that's just a brief overview of the courses. Debbie's just going to take a couple of minutes to show you some pictures. There's been a lot of text in the last few minutes. Uh, Debbie will show you some pictures and tell you more about the classes. Debbie. Thanks. Thanks.
Thank you. You heard about the courses from James, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how they're set up and, and what they are. And, and this um, is a picture from Immersion Week. Immersion Week is when the very first time students meet together, they come for five days to Penn, and we have class from eight to five. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but we have a lot of fun, as you can tell. And, um, and they stay engaged because we bring faculty in from all over the place, and this world-class faculty, they really have a chance to interact with these. The class is 41 students. They take all their courses together, and it's more a seminar than a lecture. So they really get to interact quite a bit, and then during breaks and during lunchtime, et cetera, they get to um, see these people that just have come in from various places. Another form of interaction that you get in the MAP program is with cohorts. Every, um, everyone is put in a cohort of about three to five people, and you'll do different projects with these people. You'll do a lot of things via in distance learning. You'll communicate a lot with these people, and, and it just is another um, depth that you get when you get to work with people from all different places and, and all different demographics. And one of the things that we really try to use the capstone project for is a stepping stone into what you're going to do with your application. And many people have taken this and they have created workshops that they're doing. One person actually um, took the primer in positive psychology and she translated it into Japanese and she's getting it published. And that was quite a project for her. And um, other people have published um, in scholarly journals their capstone work. And people get to give presentations. And this is um, a photo of, of someone giving a presentation at the Positive Psychology Summit. And so there's a lot of different things that students do as we bring them through the program, as we give them a solid foundation, and then we help them to start applying this and move towards that. But one of the biggest questions that we get when we have applicants call in is, what can I do with a MAP degree? And I'm going to tell you just a quick snapshot. Sasha Lewis-Hines is the first person there, and she is now in the PhD program of development psychology at Columbia University. So she came to the MAP program before getting her PhD, so she has that foundation, and that's what she wants to use and focus on as she goes through and gets her PhD. The second person up there is Senya Maiman, who has worked with hedge funds, but she found in her spare time um, she found some time to create the Positive Psychology News Daily website, which is articles about the research and application of positive psychology written by MAP alumni who are out there actually doing that. And another thing that she's been able to do, along with a lot of other MAP alumni, has been involved in trainings and been involved in projects that have come through the Positive Psychology Center. As we get different projects um, to train people in the UK to put positive psychology in their schools, the people that we draw on are MAP alumni because they have the education and the foundation that is needed to be able to put through these projects. So we hope to continue to put together alumni with various um, opportunities that come along to us. Caroline Miller is the third person there, and she is an author, and she's getting ready to publish her second book. And she's also um, a speaker and a coach, and she has had the opportunity since MAP to actually teach a lot of courses. And she's very focused on goal setting and she's very focused on sports psychology. So this has really expanded what she's been able to do. And not all of our students are Harvard graduates, but these three actually happen to be the Harvard graduates. So it's very interesting to see um, that little snapshot. And we hope that we have many more Harvard graduates coming to our program. So James, you want to finish up here? Thank you very much, Debbie. So uh, our presentation is entitled From the Classroom to the World, and certainly the MAP program is one way of taking positive psychology from the classroom to the world. Just wanted to mention very briefly another opportunity. We have just started the International Positive Psychology Association. And this is an international, it's going to be a major international organization to help facilitate co communication and collaboration among researchers and practitioners of positive psychology. Here is a picture that was taken at the first board of directors meeting that happened in October. Uh, not pictured here is Tall, who is a member of the board of directors, um, as are a number of other leading positive psychologists from the United States and around the world. Uh, there is a special student membership, so I encourage you to check out the International Positive Psychology Association at www.ipanetwork.org and join to stay abreast of the latest developments in the field of positive psychology. 
I wish we had time for your questions, but I know Tal has a lot of great stuff for you today, so we'll uh, move along. Just want to let you know that um, there will be an information session this afternoon from 3 to 4.30 in Harvard Hall, room 103. So we'd love to see any of those of you uh, who are interested to stop by and talk with us, um, and we'll be able to talk in, in more detail about the specific questions that you might have at that point. We'll also be here for a few minutes uh, after class. We have some brochures with us. Uh, we'd love you to, to, to take a brochure if you're interested. Um, there's always more information can be found on our website at penpositivepsych.org or you can email us at the address listed. So we hope to see um, a lot of you um, at the MAP program sooner or later. Um, and in the meantime, wish you a very successful semester as you dig into the science of positive psychology and uh, put it into practice in your own lives and think about how to take positive psychology from the classroom to the world. Okay. You know, it's such a privilege to be a part of MAP because what you have there in a, in a year is all the top people from the field. So many of the, the people that we'll talk about, whether it's Barbara Fredrickson, whom we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, whether it's David Cooper, either, whom we'll talk about, whether it's Marty Seligman, of course, will come there and present to you and... Um, We'll be spending quality time in small groups with them. Real privilege. So what I want to do today is um, finish up. I want to finish up on the, um, the basic premises. Second. On the final premise, no, we're not going to watch that again, no. Or that. <laughs> Here we go. The final and fifth premise is an important one. It's a philosophical one, but one that I wanted to introduce at the beginning of the course so that you understand where... I'm coming from where this course is coming from because many people say okay so happiness is important you know we seek it we have you know declarations national declarations individual declarations of how important it is for us but that doesn't mean that it is important or the is the fact that it is important doesn't mean that we ought to do it my argument here is that not only is it important, it also ought to be important. So first about the is. Happiness, whether we like it or not, whether it's consciously, subconsciously, whether it's explicit or implicit, for most people, not all, but for most people, it is the highest end. And again, we have constitutions safeguarding our pursuit of happiness. We spend a lot of effort, a lot of time thinking about it for ourselves as well as for others. Aristotle, over 2,000 years ago, happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. William James, in 1890, or in the varieties of religious experiences, writes, if we were to ask the question, what is human life's chief concern, one of the answers we should receive would be, it is happiness. How to gain, how to keep, how to recover happiness is in fact the most, for most men at all times, the secret motive of all they do and of all they are willing to endure. Now you may have heard of William James. He's named after a building here. And he talked about this over 100 years ago, Aristotle over 2,000 years ago. And it's not just peculiar to the West, the Dalai Lama. Whether one believes in religion or not, whether one believes in this religion or that religion, the very purpose of our life is happiness. The very motion of our life 
is towards happiness. So it is important for people, again, whether it's conscious, subconscious, explicit, or implicit. The question, though, is the fact that it is important, should it be important? What about the moral dimension of happiness? I mean, there are so many other things happening, so many important things to do in the world. Why should we have happiness as our, our highest end, as our chief concern, as that which determines the motion of our life? In other words, what's good about well-being? What's good about positive emotions? And there's a lot of research to answer this question. But before the research, it feels good to feel good. Think about it. Internalize it. You know, this is Aristotle's law of identity. A is A. It feels good to feel good. And that in and of itself is justification. Why not feel good? if we can feel good. So the burden of proof for why happiness is not important may be on the people who would argue otherwise, and we'll talk about that argument later. But the first key issue is that it's a good in and of itself, almost needs no justification. However, beyond just feeling good, happiness also contributes to our life to our relationships, it contributes to other people. This is research done by Barbara Fredrickson, one of the faculty members who teaches at UPenn. You saw a picture of her up there. What Barbara Fredrickson says is that pos positive emotions have an evolutionary reason, that they have a purpose beyond just making us feel good. For example, they help us think beyond what we're thinking right now, broaden our thinking. They help us build relationships. They help us build capacities. Remember, one of the key concepts in this course is that positive emotions, positive psychology as a field as a whole, is about building capacities. And the two analogies that we use was strengthening our immune system or a stronger, quote-unquote, psychological engine that has the capacity to endure more, not just from the negative to the zero, but also from the zero to the positive. So this is Barbara Fredrickson, and let me quote extensively from her article, which I believe you're reading for this week. We should work to cultivate positive emotions in ourselves and in those around us, not just as end states in themselves, but also as a means to achieving psychological growth and improved psychological and physical health over time. I call this the broaden and build theory of positive emotions because positive emotions appear to broaden people's momentary thought action repertoires and build their enduring personal resources. Through experiences of positive emotions, people transform themselves, becoming more creative, knowledgeable, resilient, socially integrated, and healthy individuals. Numerous benefits to just experiencing positive emotions. It's a win-win. It feels good and it's good for us and it's good for society as a whole, as I'll argue momentarily. So what she's talking about here, for example, is that positive emotions help us overcome negative emotions. What happens when we experience negative emotions is that our consciousness, our thinking, narrows and constricts. We focus just on one thing. So for example, and, and that can be a good thing. You know, a lion comes to me and charges me. I don't want to start thinking about my map application. I don't want to start thinking about what my roommate said. I want to focus on the lion. So my consciousness narrows and constricts, and I'm in the fight or flight mode. Now that's a good thing when a lion charges me, but it's not a very good thing if my consciousness continues to narrow and constrict beyond the threat or beyond the hardship. And what we know is that very often we enter a downward spiral, a vicious cycle, when we go into this narrow and constrict mood. So for example, just for example, a random example, my girlfriend leaves me, all right? And I narrow and constrict in terms of my thinking. And all I'm thinking about is just that. And then what happens as a result, I experience sadness because that's what I'm thinking about. And sadness, a painful emotion, not a positive emotion, leads to further narrow and constrict. And that can, can, potentially, not always, but potentially can go on and on and on 
And that's when it can become depression. That's when I have difficulty getting out of this downward vicious cycle. Positive emotions do the, the opposite. They broaden and build. Broaden and build leads to positive emotions. And positive emotions then further broaden and build. So that's a virtuous cycle. And I look broadly, I look to other people, I look to other things, so what can I do now? Where can I go? Where can I spend my time? And very often what that does, a positive emotion can take us out of this downward spiral and create an upward spiral. A positive emotion can come in the form of watching a humorous film. It can come in the form of a few deep breaths, and we'll talk about deep breathing when we talk about mind-body. A positive emotion can come in the form of an interaction with a friend, a pleasant one. And it's the positive emotion that can take us out from this downward spiral to this upward spiral. And again, it doesn't always take a very long time. And the, and the challenge is to combine it with the permission to be human, to experience the emotion, to go through the motion, and yet not to enter the downward spiral where, you know, six months later, after a small incident, I'm still in that rut. And we'll talk about what is the right time and how do you find the right time and how do you find the balance between thinking about painful emotions and when does it slide to rumination, which is not always helpful. So it helps overcome negative emotions. Also, creativity, we think broadly. We're able to make more connections. See connections that we hadn't seen before, perhaps. There's a lot of um, talk about the depressive creator. You know, if you want high levels of creativity, it's a must. You have to be depressed. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Very often, manic depressives are highly creative, but that's usually during their manic phases. In the depressed phase, our thinking is narrow. We don't think outside the box, usually. Of course, there are many exceptions, but as a whole. In fact, there is research, for example, this was done with um, internists, doctors, who were giving a very difficult, very difficult question connected to a liver problem that an individual patient had. And they divided them randomly into three groups. The first group was a control group. They just had to solve that problem. The second group was was given a statement about the humanistic value of medicine, why it's so important to be a medical doctor. And the third group was, uh, shown, uh, was, was given candy and just put in a funny, playful, good mood. The third group that was given the candy and was put in a positive, playful mood outperformed the other two groups significantly. They thought about more options, and they actually came up with better solutions to that problem. Again, this is one of many, many studies in this area. Another example, children. You know, one group of children uh, was the control group. The second group was told to think back to an experience that made them laugh or smile. And that group did much better on a learning task than the control group because they were put in a positive mood. Again, it's a win-win. It's defying in many ways the no pain, no gain paradigm, whether it's of education, of doctors, or in school, as well as generally in the workplace. Because you see also motivation and energy. You don't need research for that. You know that when you're feeling good, you have more motivation, you have more energy. And of course, there is a lot of research to back that up. And ultimately, success. They look at it in the professional world, people who are able to manage their emotions better and lead to more positive emotions, get out of this narrow and constrict to the broaden and build, are in the long term more successful. Again, it's not the people who don't have painful emotions. Remember, they're all dead. It's the people who experience painful emotions but are all at the same time able to shift themselves, their consciousness, their thinking, their experience to the positive more readily. And happier people are more successful because they have more energy and work harder. It's because they're pursuing something 
rather than running away from th something, what's called approach rather than avoidance goals. We'll talk about that during the week on goals. Also because they form better relationships. They're more open and generous. And they're more creative. All these components ultimately lead to higher levels of success. Positive emotions don't only contribute to our success, they don't just contribute to our feeling good, they also contribute to our well-being. Optimistic people, and again, not Pollyannish detached optimism, but grounded optimists, on average live significantly longer. Bless you. Their immune system is stronger. So it also helps in terms of physical health. But now the question is the moral question. What about other people? How can I talk about or act in my life pursuing my happiness? Isn't that selfish? And the answer is yes, it is selfish. When I talk to myself, when I say to myself, I want to be happier, I say to myself that I want to be happier. That's a selfish thing. So is that bad? Is that immoral? Well, in our culture, selfishness and immorality has essentially, have essentially become synonymous. And that's a problem. And here is why. Because this is the number one. Equating the two, selfishness and immorality, is the number one cause, subconsciously mostly, but not only, number one cause of unhappiness. Because people feel guilty about pursuing their own happiness. People feel guilty at times feeling good about themselves. How can I? How dare I feel good about myself? How can I pursue my own happiness when there is so much suffering in the world and there is a lot of suffering in the world? So how do we respond to that? First of all, happiness is a positive sum game. It's not a zero sum game. Neither it is, is it a negative sum game. It's not that my happiness takes away from other people's happiness, which would be a negative sum game. If I have more, you necessarily have less. It is not even a zero. Or rather, if I have less, you have less. That's a negative sum game. Or a zero sum game. If I have more, you have less. It's a fixed pie. It's not that. It's a positive sum game. Why? Because happiness is contagious. If I'm happier, I'm more likely to contribute to other people's happiness and well-being. Being happy, in other words, is also a moral state in the sense of actually contributing to other people's well-being. The Buddha talked about it thousands of years ago. Thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle, and the life of the candle will not be shortened. Happiness never decreases by being shared. It's like passing on light. And if you're happy and work on your own happiness, you're contributing indirectly to other people's happiness. Just like the, the baby who laughed last time made you laugh. It's contagious. Generally, people who work on their happiness, again, not people who experience a constant high, they would have real difficulty having relationships since they're dead, but generally people, those of us who are alive, who work on our happiness, who experience the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, but overall work on our happiness and become happier and happier, have better relationships, more generous, more accepting of other people, more tolerant of other people, as well as of themselves. There's a lot of research to show that helping ourselves, in other words, working on our happiness, contributing to our well-being, leads us to also be more generous and benevolent toward others. This is research by one of the leading researchers, one of the first researchers in the area of positive emotions, Alice Eisen. And she showed time and again how feeling good is good for us and good for others. And it works the other way as well. This is the wonderful thing about happiness. It works the other way as well because helping others also helps ourselves. Remember your task for this week, those of you who have already read it. It's to commit 
above and beyond what you usually commit, five extra acts of kindness during one day. Five extra acts of kindness. This is research done by Sonia Lubomirsky. I mentioned her book in the first class, The How of Happiness. She's done fantastic work showing how people who help, whether it's helping you know, five extra acts during the week, it can be more, it doesn't have to be restricted to five, or people who help five extra acts during one day, it actually contributes to their well-being. So helping others is also helping ourselves. You know, one of the things that I say, and only half in jest, is that I know of no more selfish act than a benevolent act. And again, only half in jest, because the two are interconnected. And there is a self-reinforcing loop between the two. We're helping others help ourselves, helps ourselves, and helping ourselves in turn helps others. And rather than looking at it as selfish, and some people may feel this ease with it, rather though as looking at it as selfish, i.e. equal immoral, we should look at it as something that is so wonderful about our nature, a part of our nature that we should celebrate. The fact that our happiness is tied to others, the fact that we're tied to others in a web of empathy, that's a wonderful thing about human nature. A thing that we need to celebrate much more than we are doing already. Because remember, if we don't celebrate it, if we don't appreciate that part of our nature, that part of our nature will depreciate. To appreciate has two meanings, as we talked about. One is to say thank you for something, and two is to grow. If we appreciate the good in our nature, in our inclinations, if we appreciate that part of our nature, it will appreciate and we will have more of it. If we look down on it and say, you know, it's a terrible thing that I just derived benefit from helping other people, then that part of our nature will depreciate over time. For your readings, you're reading one of the meditations in my book where I talk about it a little bit more in length and also give it the philosophical foundation because in many ways this goes against um, Kantian thinking that has been so dominant in our, in our 20th and 21st century thinking about morality. It feels good to feel good. It also contributes to others to feel good. I want to end this premise, this idea, by talking a little bit about a person for whom one of the chief purposes in life was to spread happiness. Mahatma Gandhi. There's a story about him. There was a woman, like many people, came to ask for advice from Gandhi. And she came from very far away and she brought her son along. And she sat in front, she got the audience with Mahatma, and she sat in front of him, and she said to him, I came from afar because I have a problem with my son. My son eats way too much sugar. And I'd like you to tell him to, to stop it, because it's hurting his health, his teeth, and he will listen to you. He admires you. Gandhi looked at her and said, Madam, can you please come back in a month? She didn't know why, but she, took, but she listened to him. After all, he was Gandhi. She left, went far away, came all the way back a month later, and once again got an audience with, with Gandhi. She sat in front of him, and she said, I was here a month ago, and she said, yes, yes, I remember. And she said, could you please tell my son to stop eating sugar, so much sugar? So Gandhi looks at the child intensely and says, son, stop eating too much sugar. And that's it. The woman is obviously perplexed and musters up her courage and says, Mahatma, thank you very much. I'm sure he will stop eating too much sugar, but why couldn't you tell him this a month ago when I came all the way here? And he said, well, madam, because a month ago I was eating too much sugar. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I know it's a very sophisticated joke. It take, takes a while, but, but I'm glad. I'm glad you got it. One of the things that Gandhi said that he talked about, and this is in his, from his um, wonderful autobiography, My Experiments with Truth, be the change you want to see in the world. Be the change you want to see in the world. This is how you bring about change. I want to do a quick exercise with you. This is a, a tough exercise, especially for, for guys, but please bear with me. So, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't do it. What I'd like you to do now is the following. Take your thumb and your middle finger and create as much as possible a 90 degree angle may hurt a little bit, but try as much as possible to create a 90 degree angle. Okay, watch me just like this, okay? 90 degree angle. Now, take these two fingers, the middle finger and the thumb, and as much as possible from that 90 degree angle, create a circle. Again, this is more difficult for men than for women, less flexible, create a circle. So that it looks like, you know, like uh, the, um, a rabbit, if you would have on the, uh, on the show. Middle finger, exactly, middle finger and your thumb. All right, just watch me like this, as much as possible. It's not perfectly round, but as much as possible. Now, take that circle that you have just created. Can you see that circle? Take that circle and put it on your cheek. Your other cheek. Cheek. All right, this could also take a while, but most people, from what I see, put it on their chin. Now, I said it very clearly, cheek, but you see, here is the thing. People mostly do what you do rather than what you say. Oh. So, remember that because... I don't think there is anyone in this room who would tell me now, my goal in life, my objective is to make people miserable. I really want to do that. You know, I want everyone to be miserable in the world. There's not one person here who would actually say that, I hope. So most of us here, whatever we do in our lives now and in the future, are idealists. We want to do good in the world. We want to spread happiness. But remember, people do what you do, not what you say. So you may want to spread happiness through your words, but ultimately the best way, the optimal way of spreading happiness is to work on your own happiness. Because then you're leading by example. That applies to leadership. The most important thing about leadership is not what you say, it's what you do. The most important thing about parenting is not how much you tell your child Honesty is important, but rather how honest you are. If you want to spread happiness, be the change you want to see in the world. By example. So these are the five basic premises that we talked about. They form the foundation of the course. And what we're going to do over the next couple of months is expand on these. Most importantly, see how we can take the research, the rigor, and apply it to our lives. So let me move on now to the next, to the next lecture. Which is beliefs as self-fulfilling prophecies. This, I must say, this topic ignited my imagination when I was a kid, when I thought about it, when I was an athlete. And that's when I understood the power of the mind. And that's what piqued my interest in psychology. And I want to start with a story, a specific story, that in many ways, I can see as the first story, psychological story that I heard, or the story that I heard that brought home to me the message of how important psychology is to well-being and to success. And success as a 
14-year-old squash player was the most important thing in my life. And the story is of Roger Bannister. Just so I get a show of hands, how many people have heard of Roger Bannister? Okay, a handful. So, those of you who have can hear it again. Roger Bannister was a runner. He ran the mile. And until 1954, running the mile in under four minutes was considered impossible. In fact, doctors proved that four minutes for the mile was the limit of human ability. Physiologists ran tests showing, proving scientifically that the limit of human ability was running the mile in four minutes. You could not go below that. And runners proved, the doctors and the scientists proved that they were right. And ran the mile in four minutes and two seconds, four minutes and one second. But no runner could run the mile in under four minutes. Ever since the mile was actually timed, or they started to time runs. It was impossible. Doctors, scientists showed runners, athletes, the top ones in the world, proved that the doctors were right. And then came along Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister said, it is possible to run the four minutes, and in fact, I'm going to do it. Now, when he said it, he was a medical doctor at Oxford University. He was a good runner, top runner, but nowhere near the four-minute mark. His best time was four minutes and 12 seconds. And of course, no one took him seriously. But Roger Bannister continued to train and work hard, not harder than the rest of the runners, but as hard as the top runners in the world. And he did get better. In fact, he broke the four minute and 10 seconds mark, four minutes and five seconds mark, and then he got to four minutes and two seconds and stopped, like everyone else. Could not go below the four minutes and two seconds. So he wasn't even the best runner in the world, but among the best. But he continued to say, it is possible. There is no human limitation on that. We can run the mile in under four minutes. And he continued to say, continue to train to no avail for years. Until 1954. On the 6th of May, 1954, on his home turf at Oxford University, Roger Bannister ran the mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. Sensation. Front page news all over the world. Science defied. Doctors defied. The impossible made possible. It became known as the dream mile. Now listen to this. For decades, Ever since the mile was timed, no one broke the four-minute barrier. It was considered impossible. And then on the 6th of May, Roger Bannister does it. Six weeks later, John Landy, an Australian runner, runs the mile in three minutes, 57.9 seconds. The following year, 1955, 37 runners run the mile in under four minutes. 1956, over 300 runners break the four-minute barrier. Now, what happened? Was it that they suddenly started to train harder? Of course not. Was it new technologies, new shoes? It wasn't. It was the mind. Look how powerful the mind is. It wasn't the fact that they were running that time and they said, oops, we're over the speed limit, let's slow down a little bit. Not at all. They were trying their hardest, their utmost. And yet the subconscious mind limited them, prevented them from breaking that barrier that happened to be not a physical barrier as the doctors and physiologists and scientists had claimed. It was a mental barrier. And what Roger Bannister did was break down the fort, the mental psychological fort. Beliefs are self-fulfilling prophecies. Very often they determine how we perform, how well or how poorly we perform. They often determine 
how good or not so good our relationships are. They're the number one predictor of life success as well as well-being, as we'll talk about. So what we're going to talk about today and next time is how beliefs shape reality. How it works, what is the mechanism, the science behind the power of the mind. Because in many ways this sounds like mysticism. And part of it is mystical, still not understandable, but we're going to talk about as much as we know why it works and how it works. There's unfortunately a lot of misunderstanding about optimism. Because the self-help movement in many ways is about, identif is about telling us how it's all about the power of the mind. Talk about Think and Grow Rich, the book. We'll talk about The Secret, which is about creating our reality through our thoughts. And there's some truth to these, but only some truth. We're going to bridge Ivory Tower and Main, Tr and Main Street and show the signs and also the danger behind that belief. Most importantly, how do we apply it? How do we enhance the belief we have in ourselves? If there is such high correlation, and there is very high correlation in predictive power to a sense of hope, to a sense of optimism, to beliefs, if they so much determine our outcome on the athletic field, in the workplace, in a relationship, if it matters so much, then how can we raise our beliefs? And we'll talk about work by um, Bendura on self-efficacy, work by Nathaniel Brandon on self-esteem. How we can make a dream into reality. Whether it's a political dream, and we'll talk about Martin Luther King's dream and approach, and how, how he did and what he did, or a personal dream, where we'll talk about the work of Herbert Benson, as well as Bendura. Once again, the Buddha. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make our world. Again, this was a claim that was made thousands of years ago. And what I want to do now is focus on the scientific foundation of this claim. And I'll start by talking about Pygmalion in the classroom. The source of the word Pygmalion is ancient Greece. Pygmalion was a sculptor. And what he did was, when he came of age, was looking for his ideal woman. He wanted to get married. So he went and looked around Athens, where he lived. He looked around the whole of Greece. He looked around the Greek Empire. He looked beyond the Greek Empire, looking for his ideal woman, a woman whom he could marry. And he couldn't find her, no matter where he looked. I mean, it's understandable. This was before 1879, which is when Radcliffe was founded. And long before Harvard became co-ed. So he couldn't find his ideal woman. And he went back to Athens. And that said to himself, well, instead of finding that ideal woman, I will create a sculpture, as he was a sculptor. I will create a sculpture in her image. And he created that sculpture. And when he looked at her, he was so overwhelmed with emotion and sadness that he couldn't find her, that he began to cry. And then Zeus, Athena, and especially Aphrodite, looking down on him, had mer took mercy and brought the statue to life. And of course, they lived happily ever after. So this is the source of the word Pygmalion. Pygmalion was then taken by George Bernard Shaw, who created a play based on a similar idea, which was later made into a musical, My Fair Lady. And the idea here is how Higgins, doctor of linguistics, took a flower girl and molded her, in a sense, into being royalty. What, of course, happened throughout the story was that she molded him more and transformed him. Fascinating story and a very important story at the time because it challenged the whole class system that people are born into a certain place and cannot and should not be moved. So a very important play at that time as well as today about Pygmalion and how people can be changed, can be transformed. 
In the 1960s, Robert Rosenthal, who was the head of our department for many years, he, he's now at UC Riverside, took this idea of Pygmalion and applied it in the classroom. Here is what he did. Rosenthal went into a group of random schools. And what he did there was went to the students, had them take a test, and then go to their teachers after and tell the teachers, your students just took a new test that was devised, a new academic test, which is called the Fast Spurters Test. What that means is that we identified students who are going to take a big leap, intellectual leap forward in this coming year, a spurt forward in this coming year. In other words, what he was saying, it identifies the students with the highest potential. And what he found then was when he told these students, uh, the teachers, or what he told these teachers was that you know, this is just an FYI. You cannot tell the students this. We don't want any discrimination in your school. But just so you know, these are your fast spurters. It's a new test, newly devised. Just so you know. Unbeknownst to the teacher, the actual test that was given those students was a regular off-the-shelf IQ test. Also unbeknownst to the teachers was that these students' names who were deemed fast spurters, highest potential students, were literally randomly picked out of a hat. So these were regular students, like all other students, but the teachers thought they were fast spurters. Robert Rosenthal leaves the school, comes back in at the end of the year, and here is what he finds. He looks at their English scores. The fast spurters improved significantly more than any of the other students. He looked at their math scores, because English is not really objective, and you know, maybe it was the teachers who thought they were better than they were really. So he looked at their math objective scores. These students signif improved significantly more than any of the other students. But here is the clincher. Robert Rosenthal administered, once again, an IQ test for all the students. And what he found was that the students who were labeled randomly so, but who were labeled fast spurters, their IQ increased significantly over the year and maintained that increase in a longitudinal study. Now, this is mind-boggling. I mean, IQ is supposed to be your intelligent quotient that you're born with. It's immutable. It doesn't change from the day you're born to the day you die, or so they thought. It changed significantly just based on the belief that the teacher had in her or his students. Beliefs as self-fulfilling prophecies. What happened in this study? Was it that the teachers were fooled and suddenly were made to see elude, an illusion? They saw an illusion? No. It was that they were eluded before. There was an illusion before, and the illusion was that they didn't see what was right in front of their very eyes, which is the potential inherent in every single student. And then Robert Rosenthal comes and fools them in a sense, but fools them into seeing what has been there all along. Before Rosenthal came, they didn't see the children on the bus, so to speak. After that, they suddenly, in some children saw that potential that was there all along. And they appreciated that potential, and that potential appreciated. They watered it, they shed light on it, and the seed germinated and grew. This is exactly what Marva Collins does day in and day out in school. She sees the potential that is there. She's not inventing something. She's not detached from reality. It's rather that people who don't see the potential in other people as well as in themselves, as we'll discuss, they're not seeing the full reality. They're only seeing part of it. They're completely missing the children on the bus. And we know how easy it is to miss parts of reality, even though they're right in front of our very eyes. All it often takes is a question that takes us on a quest, and we miss what we have seen before. Whether it was research with at-risk population, whether it was the geometrical shapes, whether it's asking only negative questions about our relationship or about ourselves, 
or whether it's not seeing the potential that exists in just about all kids, if only, if only we see it. And if we see it, appreciate it, we water it, we shed light on it, and it appreciates, it grows. So what Rosenthal did was simply shift their attention to something that was there all along. Same in the workplace, replicated hundreds and thousands of times the Pygmalion effect. It was replicated in the workplace where leaders were told or managers were told, these are your top high, highest potential employees. And these employees, again randomly picked, actually became the highest potential employees. And they succeeded much more. Retention went up for them. Performance went up. They were more likely to advance in the organization and stay in the organization, just as a result of expectation. This also works the other way. Jameson, back in 1997, this, did this fascinating study where what she said was, let's see if it works the other way. So she went to two classes that were taught by the same teacher, and before the class started, told just one of the classes that this teacher was ranked extremely highly by other um, students before, that they, as professional psychologists, rated that teacher as extremely high, and then they left them. What happened by the end of the year? First of all, the teacher was rated higher by the intervention group than by the control group, but also the students put in actually more time into, into the class and they outperformed the control group because they believed, they were made to believe that the teacher was better than supposedly he or she were. In other words, they saw the potential in the teacher. They performed, not, not even the teacher, the teacher did perform better, but the students actually performed better when they had higher expectations, when they believed in their teachers. So if you want to do well in 1504, you know what you need to do, right? It works. Beliefs, a self-fulfilling prophecy. We create our reality. Goethe, treat a man as he is and he will remain as he is. Treat a man as he can and should be. And he shall become as he can and should be. I want to move on now to a related topic. One that is very important for psychologists but also for you to apply in your life. And that is the importance of the situation we create or that is created for us. In many ways, psychology, social psychology for sure, was spawned by a series of re research that was done on the power of the situation, but it was mostly the negative power of the situation. So those of you who have taken Psych 1, those of you who haven't, may have heard of the Ash conformity experiments, where people conformed to the idea of the group. Or many of you probably heard of Milgram's obedience to authority experiment. If you haven't heard about it, I'm not going to go into depth here. Read about it. Just Google it. Some of the most important and fascinating studies in the field of psychology where a person off the street was told by an experimenter to shock another person, even to the point where the other person is screaming to stop. And because the experimenter was saying the experiment must go on and very often had a white cloak, like a doctor's or an experimenter's cloak around them, because they said the experiment must go on, very often people went, most people, Americans, went on and shocked that person, even to the point of the other person whimpering and begging to be let out, simply because of the word, the experiment must go on. The power of the situation, obedience to authority. This was done in order to show how something like the Holocaust could only happen in Germany. How people there are more likely to be obedient to authority. And what they found globally, worldwide, people have the tendency to be obedient to authority, whether it was in the United States or in Germany. Around the world, same replicated. The power of the situation. Philip Zimbardo's prison experiment. This was done at Stanford where what they did was take in, again, read about it if you haven't, I'm not going to go into depth here, where they took 
people off the street and have them play the role of either the prison warden, the guard, or the prisoner. And the experiment was supposed to go on for two weeks to show what entering a role does. And what they found was that after a week, the experiment had to be stopped because the wardens, people off the street, randomly divided, were becoming so oppressive, they humiliated the prisoners who got into their position of being humiliated, just like prisoners often feel. This explains Abu Ghraib, you know, current phenomenon, what happened in, in the Iraqi prisons, of how people off the street entered the role. They entered the role so much that Zimbardo had to stop the experiment after one week. Go on YouTube and watch the video about this mind-boggling stuff. So this is all important, good to know, important to know, but not enough. Because if the situation is so powerful, why just the emphasis on the negative? Why not think about creating positive situations that will help us lead happier, more moral lives? And this has, just like a lot of the positive psychological approaches, has been ignored with a ratio of 21 to 1. So let me share with you just a couple of studies in this area, both of them done by our very own Ellen Langer. This, by the way, the study that I'm going to share now is going to be the backbone of a movie coming out about Professor Langer, a um, person who's going to play Ellen Langer. She's the first uh, female tenured professor in the psychology department. Um, the person who's going to play Langer is um, Jennifer Aniston. And the movie is coming out, uh, hopefully... Uh, in a year, but it's about this experiment that I'm going to share with you now. So this was done in 1979. Here is what Langer did. What she did was take men who were above 75 years old and send them to a retreat, which was a 1959 retreat, meaning, even though this was 1979, the music was from 1959. The magazines that they read that they were all around were 1959. The daily newspapers were 1959. Everything was 1959. Even they had to go into the role, just like in Zimbardo, they had to play the role of 1959, as if they were 20 years younger. Now, of course, it was a psychological experiment. They had all these different measures taken before, after, and here is what they found. One week retreat. At the end of the week, at the end of the week, both mental and biological age decreased. For example, they became more flexible in tests. They became stronger. Their grasp, their legs, their body became stronger. Their memory improved significantly. So their intelligence level, as taken by tests before and after con compared to a control group, improved significantly after a single week. She measured the distance between the bones in the fingers because when we get older, we be they, the space becomes smaller, they become tighter. The length after a week increased in their fingers. They became happier. They became more self-sufficient, um, self less dependent on other people as rated by themselves and as rated by their family members. They became healthier. Their eyesight and hearing improved significantly in as little as a week just because they entered a powerful, positive situation, which goes against a lot of the stereotypes and the prejudices that they encounter in the outside world. So just by quote-unquote acting a certain role, they became that role, just like Zimbardo's prisoners became their role in as little as a week. Another study that she, done, she did and this, was, um, this is reported in her book, Mindfulness, which I highly recommend. She took in and tested people's eyesight. And she gave them a, a normal eyesight chart. Measured them, wrote down their performance. 
And then she took the exact same people, this time put them in pilot's overalls, and at the same time put them in a flight simulator and showed them the exact same eye chart. Same distance, same eye chart. The only difference being they're sitting in a flight simulator and they're wearing pilot's overalls. They were sitting there looking at the, at the eye chart and again she ran the eye tests. 40% of participants' eyesight improved significantly as a result of just changing the situation. Same distance, same chart, same everything. Different situation. The question is, how do we create a positive situation? How can we create a situation that improves us with the role? And I want to share with you a couple of studies. I'll share one study <clears throat> and then another later about the environment. First of all, the work of Baj. Priming is when we have subconscious or conscious priming. For example, you're looking at a screen, you're looking at a screen and for just a few milliseconds, a word appears, and that word primes you. And there's a lot of research on how it can prime you negatively with stereotypes, for example, with prejudices, or positively, but not enough on positively. So here is a study done by Barge, where he primed people with words associated with old. So for example, words such as old, words such as... Um, stick, word such as, you know, like a old person stick, words such as Florida. <laughs> really, that's one of the words he primed people with. So he primed people with quote-unquote old words, and then he had them take, compared to a control group, an intelligence test and a memory test. The memory of the people who were primed with quote-unquote old words they performed worse than the control group. Second, he, t he looked at these people and measured how fast they walked from where the experiment was to the elevator. And also had blind evaluators, people who didn't know which condition they were in, evaluate how they were walking. So the people who were primed with old, actually walked more stooped than the other people, and they walked significantly slower toward the elevator, not knowing that they were primed with old words. They walked slower toward the elevator than the people who were not primed with these old words. Subconscious completely. And then he did the same thing, priming people with words related to achievement. The people who were primed subconsciously with words related to achievement did better on tests than control group. Their memory improved and they persisted more on difficult tasks. And the question is, and the thing that I'll talk about next time, is how can we create consciously and subconsciously a positive environment where we actually can take out the most moral, most successful self to appreciate that self, to help the environment bring out the best in us. Next time.